Okay. And we're live. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Julie Briskman. I am the Algonquin District Supervisor for Loudoun County. And uh, thank you for joining us for our sixth town hall. Um, our other town halls have covered Pride Month, the upcoming election, public safety, and COVID-19 to uh, name a few. As your supervisor, I think it's important to keep you abreast of topics that matter to you in the district and throughout the county. Um, I do apologize in advance that our um, town hall is conflicting with the Dominion High School town hall tonight. Um, we did we have had this on the calendar for a while, so I apologize for that. Uh, but this will be recorded, and anybody can go watch it um, uh, on my Facebook page. Uh, Cascades Marketplace is of particular importance as it is the heart of Algonquian District and was once a th was once thriving with activity. Uh, in its heyday, Cascades boosted more than 500,000 square feet of occupied space and more than 40 retailers representing restaurants, professional services, retail outlets, grocery stores, furniture stores, recreation, and more. Uh, Cascades began operating in the early 1990s. It was acquired uh, by the current owner, Edens, in 2004. Uh, we all remember Corner Bakery, Senior Tequilas, Noodles and Company, and some may even remember Mahalo Cove and Boston Market, all of which once brought a fair amount of customers uh, to Cascades Marketplace. Uh, luckily, we still have Starbucks, which is great, uh, but families used to play near the fountain, by the Hallmark, visit the library, get a haircut, get in a workout, shop at the Home Depot all on one Saturday. Um, I recall playing with my kids when they were little at the red British style phone booth outside of Robex. Um, and uh, we also have extended long term stay that was available for out of town visitors and the business community. Um, and we have some tracks that actually are not owned by Edens and some tracks that were never developed. Um, all of this sounded like great ingredients uh, for a su successful town center. Um, however, over the years, we've seen a decline in retail operations, and that's not unique to um, Cascades Marketplace. In fact, the county on the whole is vastly over retailed, um, but older centers, I think, have definitely felt it more. Uh, my heart definitely broke a little when when I saw one Loudon being built because I just had a feeling that this would not be great for Cascades Marketplace. Um, more pronounced are the changes we've seen since COVID-19 has impacted all of our lives so profoundly. Um, and I think we're just in the beginning stages of what that's going to do to our economy. The world has changed and we may never may never go back uh, to the things and how they used to be. Industries, government, businesses are being forced to reimagine life. And that is what is called for in this instance. Like many uh, retail centers, Cascades has been experiencing a decline in retail and, and its consumer base. The center has lost major chains like Pier 1, Staples, the Corner Bakery, and most recently Capital One Bank, sh Bank shuttered, not because they weren't doing well at that location, but because they are reimagining their business uh, model and closing brick and mortar facilities all over. On the upside, we do have pre application, uh, pre applications have been submitted uh, for vacant property and for rezoning on others. Some of these applications are for rezoning and building housing, which is badly needed in Algonquian District and throughout the county, especially affordable housing. Uh, Cascades inhabits what's called the suburban uh, policy area, and it's designated for revitalization and to be a suburban mixed use uh, area in the county's comprehensive plan, which we'll get to a little bit more later this evening. Um, the vision for this designation includes about 60% residential, 35% non-residential, 5% public and civic space with a minimum of 10% open space. Um, but I'm not interested in a piecemeal redeveloping of Cascades or revitalization um, of Cascades. And after knocking doors uh, during the campaign last year, I got the sense that, um, that most of Algonquian residents aren't either. And that most of Algonquian residents are pretty concerned about Cascades marketplace. I think it was probably the top um, issue that folks talked to me about on the doors, um, that and, and data centers were probably the two top issues that folks um, talked to me on the doors. And so uh, we got right to work on it. 
Um, well, I'm glad that uh, developers are interested in this prime piece of real estate as your supervisor. I plan to roll up my sleeves and work really hard with county staff, um, the current owners, and perhaps new developers uh, to bring a comprehensive, innovative revitalization for Cascades Marketplace, hopefully with healthy retail options, viable commerce, and modern and innovative housing. We're limited only by our imagination in this case. Um, uh, I just wonder, like, why shouldn't we have an outdoor venue for live music? Why shouldn't Algonquian boast options for recreation, like maybe a skateboard park or a dog park? Um, why shouldn't Cascades link up with our neighbors at Nova Virginia Community College to provide affordable housing options for that community and amenities for that robust um, higher education community? So the possibilities are really endless when you start thinking about it, and I really appreciate county staff has been working hard with my office to revision what this uh, Cascades Marketplace might look like. Um, this evening, uh, I just want to assure you, is just the first of many, many conversations we're going to have about Cascades Marketplace as we work with Edens, the owners, uh, potential developers, and the county staff to provide uh, the best vision possible that we can. Um, now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Dan Galino, G Galindo of Planning and Zoning. Uh, Mr. Glendo uh, is the planning master, uh, I'm sorry, planning manager for the community planning planning good too. of Loudoun County, <laughs> uh, Department of Planning and Zoning. Prior to uh, coming to the county, he held the position of senior planner for the town of Percival. He also served as community development coordinator in Winchester, Tennessee, and a community planning, planner in the state of Tennessee's local planning assistance office. Mr. Galindo graduated from Texas A&M University with a master's in urban planning and Trinity University with a degree in urban studies. So Mr. Galindo, with that, I will turn it over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Briskman. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself and also to note, if any of you noticed some of the ads that put out, um, our director, Elena Ray, was supposed to be here tonight. She unfortunately is away um, due to a death in the family. so. I'm covering everything for planning and zoning tonight. I will do my best to answer any questions that come in, but please bear with me. Um, my background and my role right now is primarily focused on the long range planning for the county. And my team also uh, covers our heritage preservation functions as well. So we're looking backwards, we're looking forwards. We're always just trying to figure out where the county has been and where it's going and how we're going to get there. Um, hopefully, a number of you that might be watching us tonight were involved with Envision Loudon, and when we developed the new comprehensive plan that was adopted in June of last year, uh, we definitely had some outreach in the Cascades area, including over at the Senior Center. So I do hope some of you were there. Um, and now what we're trying to do, and we have been doing for the past year, year and a half, is work on putting that plan into action. The comprehensive plan is really just a guide um, for establishing policy, but it's it's not regulation. It is not something that has to be followed as a matter of law. And so now we're working on how to implement that plan through um, updating the zoning ordinance and a number of other things that we'll talk a little bit about tonight. Um, one of the reasons that we worked on revising the comprehensive plan and replacing what was known as the revised general plan, which was around for a long time, so you may have heard that term, is that it, at, at the time that we finally adopted the plan, the revised general plan had been around for approaching two decades. Um, it was getting a little long in the tooth. There were some deficiencies in it. And we've tried to open up a number of new possibilities in this new comprehensive plan, including for areas like the Cascades Marketplace. Um, one of the, the key things we'll talk about and have a slide is about the concept of place types. Whereas we're trying to provide some guidance both on the land use and things like density, but increasing the importance of design in um, what we see in the developments that come through and our comments as a staff back to the developers to try to really make the design and the, the land use kind of guidance go hand in hand so that if we're going to allow more density, more uses, um, we, we can ensure that there's a certain level of design that really allows that to function. Having one without the other is, is something that's going to cause problems um, in, in a general sense. You cannot just kind of maximize density on a spot without worrying about how people can walk around, their availability of green space, how um, people can leave the site in cars or in mass transit or other means. And so that, that's definitely something that the new comprehensive plan is looking at. I wanna to touch a little bit about zoning, but it's not really my background with the county, um, but just in Algonquin in general and in Cascade specifically, 
if you're not aware, the county actually has three zoning ordinances currently. Um, it's not a history that I fully understand, and so I won't try to cover that right now. But primarily, we most of the county operates under the revised 1993 um, zoning ordinance, including the Cascades Marketplace, to the best of my knowledge. Um, Cascades overall was approved as a as a rezoning in 1986, uh, and as Supervisor Briskman noted, the marketplace has been around since the 90s. Overall, Cascades is in the PDH4 zoning district. And when you look at what the purpose of that district is, is that it's really to provide a variety of housing, both in single family detached as well as multifamily options, supporting non-residential, which is what Cascades Marketplace is right now for Greater Cascades. Um, and really to do all that in a, in, a, in a planned way through a planned environment that fosters a strong sense of community. Um, so that's what the zoning says right now. The, for most of Cascades, including the residential piece, it's not really something that we would anticipate updating with the, the new zoning ordinance rewrite. Um, it's going to be focused on some of the new ideas in the plan that I'll cover a little bit more on a few slides. And uh, it, it's just trying to um, focus on where keeping what we have right now that's working, most of the residential area, and trying to provide new options for areas such as Cascades Marketplace that we recognize could, could use a little bit of help from a planning and regulatory standpoint. Um, one last note before I start the presentation. There were there have not been any new applications that have actually been filed for Cascades Marketplace, the area right around it yet. But we have had a few uh, pre-application conferences with potential applicants this year, uh, three so far from, from um, my recollection. Uh, a couple of them are pr proposing to add some additional residential, either on land that is still there vacant, um, somewhere near the pond closer to Route 7 or within sort of the, the marketplace proper itself on some of the, the parking lots that are there. Uh, there's also another app or potential application that has been discussed, which would um, which would allow what is currently the Hawthorne Inn and Suites to be converted into some affordable multifamily housing, primarily studios, but maybe some uh, other small apartments as well. And so, none of like, like I said, none of that has been filed. There have been no decisions on it. Um, I haven't even seen designs for it. My team hasn't seen designs for those things, but those are some some concepts out there that are currently in the works, kind of just to let you know what's what's being contemplated right now. Thank you for clarifying that. So um, do, you, do you want to speak a little bit as to what the difference is between a pre-app versus like an official application that comes in? Sure, absolutely. Okay, thanks. So whenever a rezoning comes in uh, or any of the other number multitude of applications that we get, someone is actually putting on paper what their plan is. They're providing statements of justification. Um, they are paying application fees. And so that is what formally comes into the department and then goes through a process of referral uh, and revision until it goes through the planning commission and then ultimately the board for decisions on whatever that applicant is proposing. Um, so what I had just mentioned were pre-applications and what we, in some cases, require, but if, if not always, definitely advise everyone to do is to come in and just talk with staff from planning and zoning, from our Department uh, of Transportation and Capital Infrastructure, and a number of others, to kind of talk through what they want to do, um, any impediments that they may see, give us an opportunity to kind of let them know if there's something that they want to do that's not allowed, if it may just not be uh, in compliance with the plan, and kind of advise them on some of that upfront before they go through the time, effort, and, and cost of putting together the formal application. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm going to find and share this presentation. There we go. Supervisor Brisbane, can you see that on your end? I absolutely can. And I'm sure someone will tell us that they can't see it um, on the uh, on the Facebook Live. OK, I think it's called placemaking. <laughs> <laughs> and so placemaking actually is a term that a lot of planners use these days. And it's um, not really stated directly in the new plan, but it's it's something that we're looking at through that concept of place types is we want to create functional places, neighborhoods, developments. Uh, and that goes back to that combination of looking at both the design and the land use and density that I talked about earlier. So for anyone that's watching us, um, you presumably are well aware of where Cascades Marketplace is. But if you're not, uh, if you look at the map on the left, sort of right dead center, you'll see a triangular pond. Um, the marketplace is just to the north and northeast of that. 
On the map on the right, that is actually a, a snippet of one of the maps from the new general plan. Uh, that is the suburban policy area place types map. And so the entirety of the marketplace area is in the suburban mixed use place type, which is the hot pink fuchsia magenta. I don't know what color you want to call that uh, on the map there uh, and towards the eastern edge of the county. So Supervisor Brisman covered some of this, but um, what we tried to do with place types, uh, among other things, is show examples of the the types of uses and and styles that we might want to see there in a, in, a, in a simplistic way. But so on the bottom right, you can see that you know that's attempting to show townhomes. It's showing some multifamily. It's showing some office uses, uh, and just kind of give people an idea of of the diff differences in height, in design, uh, in in spatial layout. And the same with the plan view on the top right to try to give people an idea that so in the suburban mixed use place type uh, as an example we would want to see something that's more like a consistent grid of streets something that has some open space and some park space maybe integrated within it um, but the goal of suburban mixed use is really to try to create areas that are activity nodes for the county we want people to be able to both access them by car, but also once you're in one of these areas to be able to get around on foot and feel comfortable. Um, this is sort of a, a little bit of a lesser version of some of what the plan is, is hoping to achieve uh, down by the Metro stops. But throughout the suburban area, especially along the major corridors of seven and 28, this is primarily the, the kind of thing that we're hoping we will see, you know, starting next year and, and moving on decades into the future. So each place type provides a, the guidance on what sort of the ideal mix would be for that area. And those are the percentages you see here that Supervisor Briskman had covered earlier. Um, we're anticipating having residential be integrated with non-residential, which is commercial office. It can be retail. It can be other service uses. Because these days, that is what people really want to see. And, and having the residential there nearby is what helps activate those areas throughout all parts of the day. Um, you know, in, in an ideal world, if you had a place that had offices that people were at during sort of the nine to five hours, but that someone could potentially walk from an office to a coffee shop or to a grocery store on their way home within a, a walkable area. Um, that's something that gets cars off the street. Um, it's just a, potentially, you know, not to put, um, not to assume that I know what, what everyone watching might, might prefer, but, you know, give you something that's a little bit more enjoyable than kind of sitting on traffic on, on route seven or on the greenway or something. Um, and so that's what this area is sort of oriented towards. It's for building heights, potentially up to five stories, but it can go anything below that. Um, you know, if, if it's a, a great application, they wanna have a building over five, you know, again, this is a policy document. It's not trying to necessarily create a, a line in the sand on some of these things. So it is intended to be flexible and to kind of give us some of the parameters within which to work while working with applicants and the community uh, on what they wanna see in, in any particular area. For the mixed use options in the plan, um, we do talk about things in a floor area ratio perspective instead of in a density per acre. And so if you're not familiar with what that means, essentially it's the amount of building that you can put on a piece of property. So if you have a, a if you were the owner of a parcel that was 40,000 square feet, a 1.0 FAR or floor area ratio would mean that you could put 40,000 square feet of building onto that property. So it's just a way for us to try to measure the the intensity of the amount of uses on a property without breaking every little thing down by residential space of commercial it's just kind of giving us an overall guidance on what we'd like to see there and then again as supervisor brisman had mentioned a minimum of 10 percent of open space um, it, it might go without saying that for the marketplace it doesn't meet this there, there's very little residential at or around the actual marketplace um, itself right now and so you know, Supervisor Brisman reached out to the department um, early on, back in, in the spring of this year, to start talking about what the plan called for in this area, uh, what she hoped to see in this area, and that's where we we started working on some of these ideas in this presentation um, all the way back then to kind of put into in a little bit of structure and writing what the plan calls for and what we're hoping that we can see in the area uh, over time. So as you can see here, um, we're aware of some of the deficiencies of, of what the marketplace is going through right now. Um, I actually took actually all the photos on this particular slide, but a number of these, I visited the site back in 
in May. And and frankly, um, I have no idea if they're watching right now or not. My in-laws live in countryside, so I've been coming to uh, the marketplace off and on for over a decade myself now, um, just, just being in the area. So I, I know what it looks like now, and I know what it looked like a decade ago. So I'll admit it had been a little while since I had been over there um, when I went to go look and take some of these photos. And it, and it was kind of shocking, the, the amount of commercial vacancies. Um, there was evidence of some of the deferred maintenance on, on the properties. These are buildings that are aging. Um, the design of some of them is maybe not something that, that kind of lends itself to reuse. They're not timeless. Maybe I should put it that way. Some of it is, and we'll get to it. The next slide talks about some of the good parts, but um, you know, there are some obvious issues here with just the site itself. And so we, we wanted to kind of document some of that, but also talk about the strengths of the area as well. I mean, as, a, as someone who's been going there for a long time and just as a planner, you know, the, the main street backbone through the middle of the marketplace is a really strong thing to build around. Um, and I know some of it, there's a bit more vacant that we'd like to see ult ultimately, but that's the kind of design that if, you, if we could build in some residential, if we could do some other things that you can build off of this, this grid that's kind of already there. And just around the site, you know, there's that that beautiful pond up there that's really kind of hidden from most people's view uh, that you you kind of have to really be seeking out right now in order to, to make any use of it. And if anyone can see in that bottom right photo, uh, there actually is a kayak. There's a little dot of red way out there in the middle. Someone just happened to be out there that day kayaking around, doing a little bit of fishing all on their own. Never, I didn't know that that's pond was there. Really. You got that guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish amazing. I had something that would zoom in a bit more, but yeah yeah but it's true i mean if you want to get to the pond you really have to you have to walk back you know past that those clothing deposit places or back behind home depot so it would be great if we could kind of make that more exposed to the people visiting but i'm sorry yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah absolutely it's, i mean it's a beautiful sight and, and the photo in the top right i mean that's a path that does go right along uh part of the pond but there's really not a whole lot of reason to use it given where it's it's located and what's around it right now um but the marketplace is it, it's also really proximate to some some good county services but the senior center cascades library uh the farmers market is held there on a lot of weekends throughout the year and then it, it's right up against nova as well so there's a lot of activity going along around the area it's just not something that's really being um, captured very well at the marketplace at this time and so in talking with supervisor briskman we, we threw out some ideas and we kind of came up with, with this um, visual on some of the things that we want to see and where we want to go. You know, we want the, the marketplace to be something that can attract families, couples, and the university students from Nova. Maybe something that provides additional restaurants and, and maybe a brewery, a music venue, um, something like the supervisor talked about earlier. Trying to figure out a better way to integrate the Nova campus and those county facilities with the marketplace itself. Uh, it, it's it's not done poorly right now, but it is something that I think could be better done over time if we could really bring people together and work on it. As I mentioned earlier, you know, having more residents nearby would help support the businesses that are there. There's a little bit of public green space now, but we'd want to definitely maintain that or, or build on it in the future. Try to make the site more accessible for, for bikes and strollers, um, but also connect to the, the water features I had mentioned earlier. And, and right now, and, and it's partly a matter of the the fact that there's so much vacancy right now, but there is a sea of parking throughout the entirety of that site. Um, and while that was really maybe necessary more 20, 25 years ago for some of these areas, it, it's not something that is really all that necessary now. And it's kind of actually hurting the the development overall, just because it, it helps it feel less vibrant. There's, you know, I, I would park in the middle of one of those parking spaces. And when I, when I walked to the entirety of the site, um, it's a decent walk to get to anything, even even with that nice Main Street backbone. If you're away from that, it's a lot um, a lot more disconnected feeling than than what it is right there. So, those were some of the things that we're That's we're hoping <laughs> to, to in, integrate over time. And on this slide, this just shows a little bit about some maybe kind of before and after opportunities and some different visuals of what the site could be. Um, before anybody reads too much in any of the tall buildings on here, it was not meant to be a, a perfect example of this, but just to show you, you know, some of what's possible and we've seen throughout the country. Um, for example, top left, that's a, that's an old Kroger grocery store. Um, I've, I saw plenty of those growing up in Texas, exactly in that design. 
And if you look down below, that drawing is what that site is going to be turning into over time. For is, the top that one gonna, is that one staying a grocery store, do you know? So this particular one, um, I think there, there's going to be a grocery store in a, a more minor way, not as big of a, as a Kroger's would have been at the time. But uh, yes. if you if you look at the, the area below it, it's kind of like the same footprint and same blockiness, but it's kind of chopped up into three pieces instead of one one large building. I see. But, you know, overall, it, it'd be great to provide, again, some public spaces, opportunities for entertainment uh, in various ways. Potentially, you know, using the co-location or right now adjacent location of the library, mixing that with some residential, um, just and that's more meant to kind of talk about mixing some of the civic space, whatever that turns out to be, and residential, so people can easily access some of those things, give them opportunities to hold community meetings for themselves, to to do the things that, um, you know, aren't necessarily commercial in nature. And then just going down to the left, you know, just different different ways you could orient the site to. Um, provide sort of central meeting places to put some mixed uses and, and walkability around it. And again, this is one of the things we definitely talked about with the supervisor and especially planning commissioner Kirchner was trying to make sure that we also incorporated green things into it, open space, nature, um, Supervisor Kirchner actually had provided these examples for uh, the photos whenever we were talking through this. And the two on the left are a rain garden from Shoemaker Green in Philadelphia. Um, the, the area that the girls are walking across in the upper left. And that lower, it's the kind of path that cuts right through the green in the middle of the photo there. Um, so it, you know, it gives you the feeling of nature, but when you zoom back out just a little bit, you're, you're still surrounded by other buildings, by activity. Um, by you know, sort of a hardscape and, and green space interface there. On the right, that's a photo from the Mann Library at Cornell University. Um, and they, in, they, in, they incorporated some low impact design uh, to kind of try to incorporate um, or achieve some, some ecosystem benefits, even though you know, you're right there at a large building, lots of hardscape around you, just trying to incorporate that throughout the site. And that's ideally something that we would love to see incorporated in however the um, marketplace might redevelop in the future as well. I think uh, planning my, so for those who don't know, Jane Kirshner is the planning commissioner who also has been um, working with us on this. And uh, Jane uh, knows a lot about, you know, native plants and, you know, and she's an environmentalist and also she's found examples of um, jurisdictions and municipalities that have actually used their stormwater drainage ponds and flow to turn them into water features in in development so that that's where those were coming from. Thanks. Sure. And so in, in talking with Supervisor Briskman, um, there's a number of different ways that, that we could go about trying to achieve these things, but this just sort of lays out a, a little bit of a, a potential path that up front you'd really work on building participation. Um, both with the property owners and the and potential developers or redevelopers of the site, uh, as well as the community, maybe holding some community meetings, holding a design charrette to, to bring in some of that community input on the front end before something might ever actually come through the pre-application or application process formally through the county. Um, potentially, because uh, you know of the site and, and some of the civic things around it, there could be an opportunity for a public-private partnership. Who knows, but it, it's something that at least on this site is something that could be a potential option. As far as the regulation goes, um, you know, as I mentioned, starting off this entire area right now is PDH4. Uh, I don't know if all the names of the zoning districts will say the same once the rewrite occurs, but right now, the, the district that most closely matches that suburban mixed use concept is the plan development town center area. So, you know, if something were to come in tomorrow, that would be what we would recommend uh, an applicant go for. And, you know, through the regulation, we also want to try to address some challenges. Um, you know, a retail brewery right now is not something that would be allowed by the zoning, but it is the kind of thing that we think would be useful to the site overall. It would help drive activity, it would help bring people there, allow them to walk around, um, move to, through other retailers and that sort of thing. So, you know, over time and hopefully through the rewrite, we'll be addressing some of those things and opening up additional opportunities as well. And then finally, you know, 
through working through that, then we kind of come to, to the adaptation or implementation stage of this. Um, right now, we've created these, this short slide set with a few things kind of just high level throwing out ideas. But, you know, there's an opportunity to either work with the applicant to kind of go hand in hand and, and work through a redevelopment plan of some sort, both through the county and the applicant themselves. Um, or maybe it's something that the county proactively does and, and goes and does a small planning project for that area to um, think about how it might best be redeveloped to look at some of uh, the potential for pedestrian and, and cycling through there, just as a couple of examples. And so with that, that is the end of the presentation. Um, Supervisor, would you like me to pull this down and we can start taking questions? Um, actually, could you back up for just a second to that, just that previous slide? Sure. Um, because we have had a couple questions um, and I think it might be appropriate to kind of address process a little bit. Um, I'll talk through the process and then um, if, if you wanna correct me on anything, pl please do so. So. Um, so, as we said, like, right now, there's nothing necessarily set in stone that is going to happen at Cascades marketplace. This is just the very beginning conversations and opportunity for community feedback. Um, what what would happen and there have been some applicants that have come and had pre application conferences with the county, but they have not filed officially a rezoning application that would change or build something new there. And even if that came about, um, a rezoning application in the county takes a little while to, to get through the process. So it involves um, usually discussions with the supervisor when it comes up. Um, it goes to pub it might go to TLOC, the Transportation Land Use Committee. Um, which is a committee of the board. And then uh, it might come to the board and then go back for a public hearing. There will always be a public hearing on any sort of application that comes through. And then even after public hearing and all along this, this route, things can be changed and there's discussions with developers and all along this route. After public hearing, it might then go to the board for approval. And, um, uh, so, you know, Hopefully, after all of that discussion, since we're starting so early, it would it would be approved pr pretty um, smoothly, uh, you know, months and months down the road, whatever comes up. But there have been applications that actually get turned down by the board in the end. Um, so did I did I walk that through uh, correctly? You, you did. And the one thing I would add to um, is. People may have, that are watching this may have heard the concept of proffers. In Virginia, um, applications are allowed to proffer certain commitments um, for their site or for the maybe the, the roadway right around the site to um, provide improvements to to or also they could also proffer to not allow certain uses that might otherwise be allowed by the zoning ordinance as part of their application, sort of the promises they're making through the county. But yeah, as far as the process goes, you're absolutely right. Um, there's a lot of work on the front end through all sorts of different levels of staff before it goes to the planning commission and then ultimately the board to make a decision. Oh, I, I see I left off the planning commission step. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, so we've got planning commission, TLUC, public hearing, and then the board. Um, that, that all the gates, I guess you could say that something like this might go through. Um, we had a question come through, um, Dan, that you might be able to answer and that is, um, uh, actually, you, you can take the you can take the slides down or or leave okay. up my email. Either way, <laughs> um, we had a question about the um, the type, the suburban mixed use type, and there was somebody asking um, who's who's watching if that is um, a definition or a designation that is uh, set in stone. Like, would that ever change now that it's in the comprehensive plan as that type of place? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll say selfishly concerning how long we worked on the plan. I hope it doesn't change anytime soon, but uh, no, absolutely. The, the, all of the plans and really the ordinances we work with too are all living documents. So those things can always change, but it does need to go through a formal process. Um, we are actually running through the, the first comprehensive plan amendment right now for the new plan um, for something out in the rural policy area, but it, it's something that, that the board would have to initiate. Um, they would essentially authorize staff to go and work on something and uh, Typically up front, we, we try to set up a timeline of how long that might take. Um, 
but again, it would be something that would go through the planning commission for hearing and an action and then to the board for a hearing and an action at a minimum. There could be public outreach and a number of other things, depending on the scale of, of what we're talking about. But yes, it, yeah. it could change if, if that was a desire of the community. But the comprehensive plan, I mean, it was a two year process with. Um, uh, a lot for oh, four year process. <laughs> so maybe it was the um, I'm not coming up with the right term, but the citizen input part of it was that that part was two years. The, um, the folks that came in for for the last part of it. Right. A lot of the, the formal outreach was about a two year process before we then went back and worked with the stakeholders committee, planning commissioners and so on. Stakeholders committee. That's the term I was looking for. Yeah. So we we had a stakeholders committee working on it for about two years. So. I'm comfortable with it, um, and and I I'm comfortable with that as the type of place you know we're in the suburban policy area and suburban mixed use uh, to me uh, is a reasonable um, is a reasonable definition for that area. Um, now that's not to say that you know we can't work to um, require certain things happen or don't happen through the application process. But I, a CPAM, which is what it would be called, right? A, a change to the the planning document yeah. is is kind of a heavy lift, and um, I feel like there's there was ample opportunity for public input during that process. So it wouldn't be something that I would I would necessarily um, be in favor of at this point, um, especially because our planning and, and zoning folks now have to go write rewrite all of our zoning. <laughs> For the county, which is going to be another several year process or year and a half process. We have had my, my staff tells me we have had 4 comments at a minimum to have a dog park. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know anything about dog parks? I know that zoning is not necessarily your. Um, your bailiwick specifically, but do you know anything about dog parks and how those happen in the county or don't happen in the county? I, I can't say specifically that I do. I'm not sure if that's something we define separately in ordinance or not. It's more than likely just under parks in general, but I, I'd have to get back to you. Yeah, I know we're looking at doing one at Bless Park. So I think on county property, it's a possibility. And I know that on HOA property, it's a possibility. But I don't know. I, I think it has to be kind of a special exception, probably. And, and that's not saying that I wouldn't be a proponent of it. I am definitely a proponent of it. Um, but it's one of those things that would have to be worked through, I, I think, uh, during an application process. Um, okay, with that, I am going to go to some of the questions that were emailed to us. Um, a site plan already approved? The answer is no. Um, we talked already about the zone, what the zoning, well, we don't really know what zoning says for this area. It's the new zoning, we know what the old zoning says for this area. Um, right, and one thing to note is that um, even once the zoning ordinance is rewritten, the currently the, the zoning, uh, excuse me, rezoning application that was approved back in '86, that will stay applicable for the site until something changes. So just because the zoning ordinance will change doesn't automatically mean that the site can can go and do something different immediately. I actually I think they have to apply to be part of the new zone, zoning ordinance, right? Because we've had some of those applications come through where people want to have their property changed to say the 1993 zoning versus whatever the one that was before that 76. 72, I think, but yeah. 72, okay. Uh, and, and I, I've heard a lot of discussion about that because uh, Loudon does have three ordinances. I'm not sure where they've come down on on it at this point. So potentially they could have to go through that process of of coming into it, um, or maybe, hopefully, from my opinion. Um, it's something that's a little bit smoother than having to go property by property. We'll see. And, and say one more time what this property is zoned for right now without changing it. So right now, this property and really all of Cascades is part of PDH4. PDH4. And what does that mean as far as like how much housing could go on it versus retail? Or... So the the four um, in that district is really defining the, the density of four dwelling units an acre. That's um, what I thought. Net over the site. It, it does allow some non-residential uses. I, I don't know it well enough to know if it really gets specific about sort of a, a percentage or anything like that. But um, I mean, Cascades is a, is a good implementation of what that district is. It's largely residential, you know, a mix of, of townhomes and single family and even some uh, multifamily mm -hmm. that kind of averages out to that four dwelling unit an acre. And then you've got the marketplace up front. Gotcha, okay, 
Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I thought it was PD4 and I just wanted to double check and, and make sure those watching know what PD4 actually means. Um, uh, we have a question that asks, will housing be affordable housing? And the short answer is we don't know because we don't have a specific application in hand um, asking us for housing right now. We have had some pre-application meetings um, of folks looking at housing um, options there, and uh, they they haven't been discussing quite yet affordable. I do know that the the applicate the pre-application for the um, the uh, longer term stay would be more affordable simply because it's studio apartments and smaller apartments, I think, I think is the argument there that they would be much more affordable, say for a recent college graduate or even a, a college student. Um, I will say that I am a proponent of affordable housing and I wanna make sure those watching understand what that means. I, I prefer to call it attainable housing because um, in the county, when we're talking about ADUs or affordable dwelling units, we're talking about housing for teachers, firefighters, sheriff's deputies. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you think about what our area median income is, our area median income is around $128,000, $135,000. And affordable housing, I believe, goes down to, um, that there's variations of it, but it might be 60% of AMI is, is an affordable dwelling unit. And then that person would get um, special dispensation to be able to, to borrow money from the county to purchase the, the affordable dwelling unit. But normally that means a teacher, a firefighter, a deputy, um, so, uh, you know, a, a receptionist or, so, or somebody along those lines um, who can't afford uh, some of the larger single family homes in our area. So um, our viewers might recall when we did countryside, it started out with, um, I think, six or eight affordable dwelling units, and we ended at, I think, 11 affordable dwelling units. So I actually lobbied for um, having more affordable dwelling units because um, housing is, is just a big issue in our county. Um, would you have any comment on that, Dan? I can tell you from a, a plan perspective, um, the guidance that we provide is is talking for affordability all the way up to 100% of the area median income. And so I think most commonly that there's uh, our housing folks know this better, but it kind of ends up in three buckets. There's like a zero to 30% of that 30 to 70 and 70 to 100. Um, a lot of our efforts are in the middle there. Things mm -hmm. that are on the low end of zero to 30, we, we would love to get and we always try, but that is so much less than, you know, what's around and just with land prices, it's always something that's very hard to obtain. Um, and then honestly, one of the things that the plan is hoping to, to implement more than we've currently done is that 70 to 100% area. Um, that's always kind of been left out because I guess it tends to be viewed as close to sort of the, the averages around here. And so it doesn't seem like something that would need help, but at least in the most recent years, so much of what we have seen has been on the higher end of the market but even now, we, that is something that we want to put a bit more focus into. Yeah, and strangely enough, um, housing prices have actually gone up over the last um, six to eight months um, in the county, which I guess it's a demand thing because interest rates have gone down. But um, it's not it's not making it much it's not making it much easier to to own your home to own a home. <laughs> um, Okay, so we have about uh, 15, about 15 more minutes. Let's see if we have some other questions. Um, are they planning on building any more housing? We already answered that question. It would likely include more housing under the new um, comprehensive plan. Um, and would the housing be multifamily or single family housing? Um, so, what we've seen in our pre-app um, conferences is mostly multi. Um, and I think that's partly because that's what's needed, but also partly because of just the nature of the land that's there. Um, and also how expensive the land is because um, the folks that are building the housing, they, 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 um, they can't necessarily give it away and property is really expensive in Loudoun County. So, so far, 
Um, it looks like some form of townhouses um, or two over twos or something like that. Uh, but again, we don't have an official application in yet. Would you see anything along single family homes going in that area? I, I would highly doubt that something like a detached home would go in there. Maybe some townhomes, but detached, mm -hmm. I just don't think would be reasonable. Yeah. And then um, what about senior senior uh, housing? We've had some questions about that. And um, so far, we, we haven't, any of the pre-application conferences have not discussed senior housing, but how does that come about in the county? It's really just the same as any other application that would come through. Um, it's one of the things that would be generally noted as part of the application that it's going to be a commitment to senior housing. Uh, mm -hmm. Because those are things that actually tend, depending on the specifics of the application, um, tend to be written into the deeds to limit it to someone that's over a certain age and, and that's it. So they they make those commitments up front, uh, especially most commonly because when it comes to the planning commission, and the board that helps you know that there will not be school children and some of the other needs that might be um, associated with sort of a, a general residential application. Right, exactly. I know that there is so, so folks have not been asking about developers have not been talking to me about senior housing there. Um, uh, we do have uh, Park Central uh, in my district and then Falcons Landing and then also the um, right across the street right across Route 7 is that new development going in in Sterling. That's mostly affordable senior housing, I believe. Um, in Karan's district. So it is going in in the county and we definitely have a need for that as well, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Dog parks we covered, uh, suburban mixed use we've covered. Wow. Um, I will I, note one other thing on suburban mixed use if you don't mind, because mm -hmm. it's something that I mentioned and it, it's not really captured on the slide very well. Mm -hmm. You know, the slide in, in your initial statements had mentioned sort of these one number target, 60% residential and some other things. If anyone was interested in going back and looking at the general plan, we actually provide a bigger ranges of what's potentially allowed in those areas. Mm -hmm. Those are just kind of like the targets that we, we give people up front. Um, so, and I, I forget the question that came through earlier where I, I meant to mention this, but um, you know, in the plan it's right now, it shows 60% on the slide. We've said that, you know, maybe up to 70% residential could be appropriate in certain cases, but also on the flip side, um, right now, non-residential is 35%. The plan actually would support something going all the way up to 95 or hundred percent if it's what fits the area. Um, it, it if, especially maybe if someone's coming in with a smaller site that's surrounded by some other things. So, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the plan is meant to be flexible and not just to have that, that one number be the only target, um, whenever someone's discussing sort of mixed use in general or cascades marketplace specifically. Right, so it's, it's not like a hard line target necessarily that, you know, you're going to get disqualified if you have, you know, 55% housing versus 60 or, or vice versa. And I have to say that, I mean, I've been on the board, um, you know, for almost 11 months now, and I haven't seen applications come in that have um, the record. How do I want to put this? I've, the applications I've seen come through have more green space than required. Generally, I've seen, which which I find heartening. Um, and you know, I will say again that I, I I'm not interested in having sort of this piecemeal um, development of Cascades Marketplace, and it's going to require having. The current owners of the majority of Cascades Marketplace talking with the folks that are buying some of the other property there um, or putting in applications for some of the other property there, say over by the pond, and making sure that that, that you know they're talking to each other. So we have a cohesive um, plan moving forward. Um, my vision for Cascades Marketplace is a place where families hang out. Um, you, you might go to the brewery with your dog, um, provided we get the special exception, <laughs> that you're walking there with your stroller, that you're biking there, you know, uh, from other areas of the district, 
and even eventually from the other side of Route 7, once we get the crosswalks and all that working. Um, and I, I really want to see it as a vibrant area that's that you don't necessarily have to drive to that folks in the district could ride their bikes. They could push their strollers. They could, they could get some of their errands done perhaps, but also enjoy a meal, enjoy some music, enjoy some recreation for their dog or themselves. Um, and, and have it really be a destination place for, for the county, if, if not just the district. Um, and I, 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 I always call my district the district for higher education because we've got GW, we've got Nova. Just on the other side of Tomac View, we've got um, you know, George Mason. So I really am interested in, in how we can kind of combine those, those things together. And um, I talked a little bit, of, I've talked a little bit about this, or you talked a little bit about it in your presentation, but we have the library and the senior center there, which are which is county owned land. And both of those places are getting to the point where they, they might need some sort of renovation or renewal. And I know that the county has um, worked with developers before to, um, to, to, you know, I, trade wouldn't necessarily be the right word, but to work on renovating or revamping or revitalizing our county facilities or something like that as we're working on the center as a whole. Um, I know it would be a super duper heavy lift, but I really would love to see the senior center and the library actually put inside of Cascades Marketplace and then maybe the housing be on the outside so that those county facilities are actually the center of the activity. Um, but that's going to require a lot of work with <laughs> with the developers and with Edens. So. Ah. So we have a late viewer asking for a recap. <laughs> well, you know what? It might be a great time to do that. <laughs> it's 752. And someone else was asking about bike lanes. So I, I will say um, bike lanes. So in countryside, uh, in that, you know, the, the theater um, redevelopment, we were able to ask the developer to put bike facilities, bike lanes on 777. Um, so that is definitely always something that's top of mind for me um, anytime we're looking at any sort of revitalization in my district. And it's top of mind for me, um, even if the road is just getting repaved. And with our new county transportation plan, um, deline delineating where bike facilities would belong in the county so we have a more connected county, um, I'm always looking for ways to incorporate bike lanes even when the roads just get paved. Um, and we just did that on Whitewater um, a, as a start. So uh, anytime we can get a little bit of bike lane out of a, out of a revitalization, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, so as a recap, um, Cascades Marketplace is in need of some love. <laughs> County staff and my office have been working really hard to, to come up with a vision of what we think Cascades Marketplace could be. Um, planning and zoning has been great about um, educating me on ways that, that the county can help uh, sort of from a reg regulatory side of things uh, and even from a um, uh, just a communication side of things, putting together the PowerPoint on, on how we can accomplish this. Right now, if someone has just tuned in, we want to let you know that there are no um, formal applications in yet to to do anything at, in Cascades Marketplace. Um, I just really wanted to start this conversation as soon as possible um, so that I have an understanding of what the community is looking for uh, and also have an understanding from planning and zoning and, and developers might be coming in what they're capable of doing and what we're capable of doing from, from the regulatory side. So this is just, I, I would call a starter conversation on Cascades Marketplace. It's something I heard a lot about from constituents when I was knocking doors and, and um, even when I'm just out and about every day in my district, um, people are talking about it a lot because a lot of us are kind of sad, <laughs> you know, to see to see Corner Bakery go, to see, you know, Senior Tequilas go um, and some of those other places. And I, I don't know what we're going to do in Algonquin District if Starbucks ever goes away. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> 
So, um, so anyway, so, so that's what this is about. We are happy if you want to um, email uh, julie.briskman at loudon.gov or zachary.harris at loudon.gov if you would like the, um, the PowerPoint um, sent to you, the visioning PowerPoint that we've created uh, with planning and zoning in my office, we'd be happy to send it to you. And anybody uh, who wants to can watch this on um, Facebook. It'll be up there uh, in perpetuity now and also on our on our YouTube channel. Daniel, did you want to add anything to, to my summary? I don't know if I was kind of hopping around a lot there, but I, <laughs> I got everything. <laughs> I, I think in, in generally, um, you know, like you said, this is something that we're aware is a community concern. Uh, we are on the very front end of, of all of this, and there's a lot of potential opportunities to to tackle this in a number of different ways. Um, so I, maybe just stay tuned at this point. Yeah, well, Dan, I really appreciate your time. And, and I will say um, I've had uh, two virtual meetings and one walk through the property with Edens, who are the current owners. And they have said to me, we've never had a supervisor come ask us about one of our properties, <laughs> like before we wanted to make changes to it. And, but they had already started thinking about it as well. And they, they are thinking about it and they're talking also to potential uh, folks who might be coming in to, to work on the revitalization and redevelopment. So thank you so much, Daniel, for your time. I really appreciate it. Please uh, give Elena our love. I hope that everything's going okay for her and we're really sorry she couldn't make it tonight. Absolutely. And um, Algonquian District, send us some emails and uh, we will see you next month. Actually, I'm very excited. We have um, our town hall is actually going to be our Algonquians Got Talent Awards program. And we're going to have some performances and we're going to give some awards to some amazingly talented Algonquian residents and students. I've been watching the um, entries this week and like my heart is so full to see um, uh, how many have uh, entered the Algonquin's Got Talent contest. So with that, we will say good night and thank you again. Good night, everybody. Good night.